Welcome back to the Oxford Mathematics Public Lectures Home Edition. This will be our fifth event. My name is Alain Gorielli, and I'm in charge of external relations for the Mathematical Institute. Special thanks to our sponsors, XTX Market. XTX Markets are leading quantitative-driven electronic market maker with offices in London, Singapore, and New York. The ongoing support is crucial in providing you quality content. The current pandemic crisis has underlined the importance of mathematics and numbers. Not a day goes by without news about the reproduction number, the number of cases, the number of tests, and sadly, the number of deaths. All are these numbers collected, evaluated, and presented has led to much confusion, manipulation, and endless argument. The problem goes straight to the heart of what statistic is and how it is used and sometimes abused in society. More than ever, there is a need for clear explanation of numbers and how they are used in decision-making processes. I'm particularly happy that Tim Harford has accepted our invitation to give a lecture about his issues tonight. Many of you know Tim through his work at the Financial Times, the BBC, or through his books. His show, more or less, on Radio 4 has been particularly influential in bringing light into the recent darkness. Tonight, Tim will talk about his recent book, How to Make the World Add Up. Thank you very much, Tim, for doing this. Please start now. Hi, Tim Harford here, and thanks so much to the Oxford Mathematics Department for hosting this talk about my book. Um, before I actually start talking about the book and answer the questions that you've sent in on Twitter, one moment, uh, and if you're watching this after the 14th of October, you can skip ahead a minute. Uh, I wanted to talk about Blackwell's Books, uh, the amazing bookshop on Broad Street, the heart of Oxford. When my book came out, it sold out absolutely everywhere, except Blackwell's Books, who had actually gone to the trouble of having enough confidence in me to order enough books. They didn't instantly sell out. So I wanted to say thank you to them. Uh, so uh, I've teamed up with them uh, to supply personalized dedications of the book, which isn't very easy in this uh, time of coronavirus. So if you're, um, actually, if you're anywhere in the UK, you can get Blackwell's to send you the book. If you're local, you can order the book. Um, the book looks like this, How to Make the World Add Up. And it's so kind of them to, to agree to do this. But if you email oxford at blackwells.co.uk before the 14th of October, if you include your name, your contact details, the person you would like me to sign the book for, and if you've got a short message like happy birthday or merry christmas is not too early for christmas presents uh, just include that and i will come into blackwell's i will sign a whole bunch of books i will personalize them for you and then after i've done that uh, you can get in contact with blackwell's you can go in you can pick up your book you can ask them to send it to you so please do that before the 14th of october 2020 and then the book should be available after the 16th of October 2020 to collect or to arrange to deliver. Okay, uh, personalised Blackwell's book message over. Let's talk about storks and babies. Where babies come from. You may have heard the, uh, the old saying that the stork delivers your, your baby brother or your baby sister. That's where babies come from. Uh, and uh, you, you may alternatively have heard a number of uh, rather wild, implausible, and somewhat disgusting theories about alternative explanations for where babies come from. You can put those out of your mind uh, because the truth is babies do come from storks. Storks do deliver babies. And if you doubt that for a moment, be reassured that I can prove that with statistics. It's very simple. All you need to do is uh, gather together a list of the number of babies born in each country in, say, Europe per year, and the best estimate of the breeding population of storks in each country. And you can just plot them on a simple scatter plot, uh, babies and storks, and you will see just eyeballing the graph that there appears to be a relationship. And when you do the, the maths properly, you will find a very strong correlation, far too strong to have been produced by random chance. 
And uh, in case you think, well, why would I trust that guy Tim Harford? What's he ever done for the world of statistics? I can assure you that this has survived peer review. There is in fact a published paper entitled Storks Deliver Babies P equals 0.008. And without getting into all the technical details, all the zeros after the decimal point mean this relationship is real. It's not a coincidence. There is a strong correlation between storks and babies. Now, by this point, you may be wondering how exactly the trick is done, or perhaps you've figured out the trick. It's pretty simple. Think about a place like Monaco or Luxembourg. There's not a lot of play room for babies and there's not a lot of room for storks. Uh, alternatively, if you imagine a country such as Germany or Poland, loads of space for storks and plenty of space for a high population, which means plenty of space for babies too. So what this relationship is measuring, it's perfectly real, but what this relationship is measuring is basically um, big countries versus small countries. It's, it's land area that's really being tracked. Now, uh, congratulations if you figured out exactly how the trick was done, but if you, if you want to understand this sort of statistical conjuring, there's no better book to read than How to Lie with Statistics, which is an elegant little work. It was published first in 1954 and written by a journalist named Daryl Huff. And it immediately got rave reviews in the New York Times and elsewhere and went on to be, um, so they say, the best-selling book about statistics ever published. And I, I can see why the book has been so successful. I read it when I was a teenager. I learned a lot. It's great. It's funny. It's got cartoons. Uh, the examples are really good. They're really incisive. They're written with, with real wit. And they have a dodgy grass. They have a dodgy maps. And the, the whole thing will really help you avoid being fooled by phony statistics, by people who are trying to deceive you. And of course, there are plenty of people out there who try to deceive you. Uh, Daryl Huff uh, lays out his stall very clearly. He says the, the crooks already know these tricks. It's the honest folk who have to learn them in self-defense. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a, a witty little book about how, how to lie with statistics, except that over the last, 10 years or so, I've become increasingly uneasy about that book and about what it represents. And what does it say about statistics? And what does it say about our attitude to statistics? The most successful book ever written about them is from cover to cover, a warning about misinformation. Once you start treading down that path, it becomes very easy to imagine that lying with statistics is all anybody ever does. And I think that's a problem. Because let me contrast How to Lie with Statistics, published in 1954, uh, with something else that happened in 1954, which was that uh, two British epidemiologists, Richard Doll and Austin Bradford Hill, published some of the first compelling evidence that smoking cigarettes dramatically increases your risk of lung cancer. Now, this is a, a really important result, and there, there were other scientists working on this result around the same time. But it matters okay, to discover that this very popular product that people use all over the world, to discover that that's killing people in large numbers, that it's extremely dangerous, well, that's a vital piece of information. And that piece of information has contributed, of course, to substantial declines in rates of smoking in developed countries and to longer life expectancy and reduced heart disease and reduced lung cancer and, and all kinds of good things. And this is a life-saving discovery. This is tens of millions of people having their lives saved by, or by what? By a discovery that was made using statistics. Because when you think about it, you realize you couldn't have figured this out in any other way. I mean, there was one doctor in Argentina who uh, treated a vast number of patients with throat cancer and lung cancer, and he noticed that um, cancer rates were on the increase. But actually, even just to notice that, 
it would be an unusual thing, much easier to notice that lung cancer is dramatically increasing through statistics. And, and by statistics, I don't mean anything terribly sophisticated, I just mean you know, somebody's got to count cases of lung cancer and write them down somewhere. So even to notice it, even to see that there's a problem, requires a statistical perspective, even, even quite a simple one. And to diagnose what is causing this huge increase in lung cancer, well then you, you really need to ask the questions in a statistical way, you need to ask them very carefully. And bear in mind that Richard Dole didn't think that cigarettes were to blame. Bradford Hill and Dole, by the way, were both smokers, um, at least at the beginning of their research. They, you know, the, the research cured them of that habit. But Richard Dole thought that it was probably something to do with, um, with the tarmac on the roads. And another theory, quite a, quite a plausible theory, is that it was pollution from cars. Because you think about this huge increase in lung cancer that's taking place through the late 1930s through the 1940s into the 1950s. Well, what else is going on? A lot more cars. So it makes sense, but to really examine and to figure out, is it the cigarettes or is it the cars? That requires the statistical lens. So what Dole and Bradford Hill were doing was not incredibly complicated. It, it did require care and it required effort. At one stage, they uh, sent a uh, what they called a questionnaire to about 60,000 doctors. They thought, hang on, if we, if we contact all the doctors, that's, that's a great group of people to contact. For a start, 80% of them smoke, but also we're not going to lose track of doctors because they're all on their medical register. Uh, and when a doctor dies, we'll know what he or she died of. So they're a great group to examine. But this of course made them extremely unpopular with doctors because um, nobody wants to be told that this thing that you're smoking is, is killing you. Uh, and one doctor buttonholed Austin Bradford Hill at a dinner party and, uh, and said, oh, you're the chap who wants us all to quit smoking, are you? And Bradford Hill responded, well, not at all. I just want to see how you die. If you quit smoking, I want to see how you die. And if you don't quit smoking, I want to see how you die. So do what you wish. Quit or keep going. I will chalk up your death anyway, and it will be very useful to me. I should mention Austin Bradford Hill originally trained as an economist. It's where he learned his charm. Uh, so this is important work. This is vital work. But now let's think about these two visions of statistics that have emerged in the same year, 1954. You've got Daryl Half, who says it's a trick. I'm going to show you where the magician hides the rabbit before pulling it out of the hat. And, it, and it's great fun, and uh, it's clever, and we can appreciate it, but don't ever take it seriously. Don't ever think of it as more than a game. In the very same year, Richard Dole and Austin Bradford Hill, using it not as a trick, but as a tool, a tool to understand the world. And they realized that this is not a game, that the, or if it is a game, the stakes are incredibly high. And my aim in writing how to make the world add up is above everything else to urge you not to be seduced by this vision of Daryl Huff where statistics are a trick, and instead to embrace the perspective of Richard Doll and Austin Bradford Hill, to use statistics as a tool, like a, a, an astronomer uses a telescope or a radiologist uses, a, um, uh, uses an x-ray machine or, or air traffic control use radar. You know, there are certain things about the world that we can't perceive in any other way and we need statistics to show us what's going on. And I think the virus, the pandemic, has underlined that point. I mean, it's a, it's a heck of a way to be proved right about what you were trying to say. But to understand where the virus is and who's got it and how quickly it's spreading. And is it, is it spreading or is it in retreat? And how dangerous is it? And who is it dangerous to? And how can we fight it? What are the treatments that are most effective? These are all 
one way or another, statistical questions. And I think we learned back in February, March, when we were scrambling to make incredibly high stakes decisions with basically very little information, we learned that having the data matters, having the statistics matters. And when they're not available, or whether they're patchy and incomplete, we suffer as a result. So it makes me angry to just hear people going, oh yeah, lies, damn lies, and statistics, or you can prove anything with statistics. Because the, this is a life-saving tool, a life-saving tool. And we should not take it for granted. So one of the things that I'm trying to do in the book is to give people a little bit more confidence to use that tool for themselves. To, to teach you certain habits of mind that I've picked up in 13 years presenting more or less. Questions to ask, things to be curious about that will help you evaluate the claims that you see and think more clearly about them. Uh, one friend of mine, Matt Parker, uh, the stand-up mathematician, said, oh, so, so Tim, so you've written this book about statistics? And I said, well, no, I haven't, I haven't written a book about statistics. I, I've written a book about how to think about the world. And for me, it's just statistics are an important tool for thinking about the world. And I, I, I really believe that it's not as complicated as we often make it seem. The questions we need to ask don't require a great deal of technical expertise. Now, um, I spent some time talking about what happened in 1954, and there is a reason why I'm, I'm so obsessed with this sort of period of history in the, in the early 1950s. It's because that was also the time at which the tobacco companies started realizing that the scientific evidence was coming in showing that their product was dangerous. And they had to figure out their own response. And the way they responded, I think, was, was quite brilliant in a, in a dark way. I mean, think about the problem you face. Your product is probably killing the people who consume it. Think about how anxious people get about even, even small things. You know, we, we worry about um, things like gluten these days. And, 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 and yet this is a a product that is killing people in, in large numbers, like thousands of people every week are dying. What on earth is your response to that? And what the tobacco industry realized was, look, people who smoke, they would like to believe that the product is safe. They would like to believe that this thing that they enjoy, um, that they find quite social, that they would find it difficult to quit, They'd like to believe that it is not killing them. So that you, they want reasons to believe. And you don't need to prove that cigarettes are safe. All you need to do is give them reason to doubt that they're dangerous. Skepticism, doubt, is the weapon. I think this was a brilliantly simple realization. When you look at the evidence, it, it does seem that doubt has a particular kind of power. There's lots of evidence in the book on motivated reasoning and people reaching conclusions that they want to reach. But one of the very first studies that I discuss uh, by uh, two psychologists called Carrie Edwards and Edward Smith shows that negative arguments, doubtful arguments, they flow with a particular fluidity. That it's sure, people are pretty good at coming up with reasons to believe what they want to believe, but they're really good at coming up with reasons to disbelieve what they want to disbelieve, to doubt what they want to doubt. And that's why um, slogans about lies, damn lies, and statistics, or, or fake news, they're so powerful. You get to this point where We've all had enough of experts, because the experts are telling us things we don't want to think, we don't want to believe. Now, we've seen these sorts of um, doubt-seeding strategies, we've seen this sort of approach used in all kinds of politics and sort of debate over climate change and so on, but it started with cigarettes. It started with the cigarette companies sounding very reasonable, saying, well, look, 
uh, the world's a very uncertain place, which is true. Experts disagree, it's true. More research is needed, that's true. I mean, it sounds very reasonable, sounds very scientific, but in the end, you very quickly get from the, the Royal Society's motto, nullius in verba, uh, take nobody's word for it, to nobody knows anything. And if nobody knows anything, you can believe whatever you want. In the 1960s, 1965, if I remember rightly, US Congress held a, uh, a hearing to decide whether cigarette packets should have health warnings on them. It was a Senate uh, hearing, and they called in all kinds of expert witnesses, the epidemiologists and, and others, to discuss the risks of smoking and the pros and cons of putting these health warnings on. And one of the witnesses who was called sat down in front of the senators and started to uh, explain that there's a correlation between storks and babies. And uh, this correlation is pretty robust, but of course that's not because storks actually deliver babies, it's because larger places have plenty of room for babies and plenty of room for storks. The expert witness's name was Daryl Huff, author of How to Lie with Statistics. Because his brand of scepticism souring into cynicism was absolutely perfect for the tobacco industry. It's exactly the kind of message they wanted. So they hired him. They paid him to work on a sequel called How to Lie with Smoking Statistics. And they persuaded him to testify in front of the Senate. And the senator leading the, uh, the committee hearing said, do you honestly mean to tell us that you think there is as casual a connection between cigarettes and lung cancer as there is between storks and babies? And Daryl Huff replied, well, the two seem to me to be about the same. That's when I really start to worry about how, how to lie with statistics, about what it represents. Because it's right to maintain a healthy skepticism. It's right to notice that statistics are often used to deceive us. But when we descend into that mode of thinking, that it's all a trick, that it's all a joke, that you can't believe anything, very quickly you end up siding with a guy who sits in front of the Senate Commission and says that cigarettes and lung cancer is basically just the same as storks and babies. We, we end up in this sort of defensive crouch where we're basically not willing to believe anything on its merits. We're not willing to weigh up the evidence. We're just scrabbling around for reasons to believe whatever we want to believe. And I think that's a shame. In fact, I think it's a tragedy. And I don't think it's that hard to push back and to stand up for ourselves and to say, actually, this stuff isn't so difficult. I can tell a, a clear argument from an unclear argument. I can tell the difference between someone who's seeking after truth and someone who's just trying to win some political debate or score a few points. I can tell the difference between truth and lies. It's not that hard. There's uh, an old story about Galileo and his telescope. At the time he was looking at the moons of Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, um, and the Catholic Church was persecuting him. And he said to the cardinals, look, I, I've got my telescope here. Just, just take a look. I'll show, you, I'll show you what I see about the solar system. And that the cardinals wouldn't look. They thought the telescope itself was full of trickery, some kind of magician's tool. Now that story has been exaggerated over the years, um, but we still tell it. And we tell it in this sort of smug way, that we, we dismiss these uh, outdated beliefs and this, these religious extremists. But I don't think we should be so smug, because I see people behaving like that around me every day. 
Remember I described statistics as, a, as like a telescope. They're a way to see facts about the world. Facts about the, the human brain, the human body, about the economy, about the environment, about this incredibly complex world in which we live. They're a way to see things we can't see in any other way. So that's why I describe them as a telescope. And every day I see people who won't pick up the statistical telescope. They won't use it, they won't look through it for exactly the same reason that allegedly the cardinals wouldn't look through Galileo's. Because they were afraid of being tricked. So don't be afraid. I, I urge you to have a bit more confidence in yourself. I don't think it's as hard as we sometimes make it out. And the 10 rules of thumb that I've outlined in the book, I hope, are rules that anybody can use. So, have some confidence in your ability to distinguish truth from fiction. Have some confidence in your ability to think clearly about the world. A lot of it is simply about wanting to know, wanting to understand. And I think all of us should be willing to pick up this statistical telescope and to look around. We'll be amazed at what we see. Thanks for listening. I have received many, many questions on Twitter because I asked. Some of the questions were along the lines of, why are you taking questions on Twitter? Um, why can't you give the talk live? Well, um, you know, there are different ways to give talks. We're all trying to experiment and adapt in uh, this, this COVID era. Uh, I'm really delighted to have been asked to speak at the Maths Institute and I, I hope you've enjoyed what I've said. Um, but I do have these questions and I wanted to leave um, quite a bit of time for questions because the questions that have come in I think are a really great way to get into some of the ideas in the book and some of the practical tips um, that, I, uh, outline, that I outline in the book. I should wave the book around, shouldn't I? There we go. How to make the world add up. Ten rules for thinking differently about numbers. So, okay, questions. Uh, question from Sarah Brighton. What are the best questions to ask when we see statistics used in the new news to help understand them? Uh, it's a great question, partly because basically the, the ten rules in the book, the ten, they're not really ten commandments, they're ten habits of mind, uh, plus the golden rule at the end of the book. They, I mean, they are my answer to the question. The book is basically the answer to this question. W what questions should we ask? And when we see statistics used in the news. But let me give you a, a, a few examples and take a little bit of time to, to, to focus on this question because it is so central to the idea of the book. So the first question I would ask I think might surprise some people. So I begin the first chapter of the book uh, by telling the story of Abraham Bradius. Abraham Bradius uh, was a great art critic in the late 19th and early 20th century. I describe him sitting in his, uh, in his villa in Monaco, enjoying a well-deserved retirement uh, and enjoying the admiration of the art world for his expertise, when in the 1930s uh, a charming uh, Dutch lawyer named Gerard Boone visited him and showed him a painting and asked his opinion. Um, because Boone said, we, 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 this painting has recently been uh, discovered from a private collector, and we think it may be by Johannes Vermeer. Johannes Vermeer, the great Dutch interiors painter. And Mr. Bradius, you are the world's leading expert on Vermeer. So could you tell us what you, what you think of the painting? And Abraham Bradius was spellbound, almost literally. He, he later wrote, or shortly afterwards wrote in an art magazine, uh, Burlington, he, that, that when he saw this painting, he said, I had difficulty controlling my emotion. He said he felt that he was in the presence not just of, of a Vermeer, but the masterpiece of Johannes Vermeer of Delft, quite different from all his other paintings, uh, and yet every inch of Vermeer. He also described it as, as ongarept which is the Dutch word for kind of virginal and pure and un uncorrupted and untouched. 
which was ironic because basically it was a fraud. And it was not only a fraud, it was a really a nasty, vicious fraud by a really nasty, vicious man, um, whom I describe in the book. Uh, and it wasn't even a very good painting. And the thing, the one thing you can say about Johannes Vermeer is the paintings are good. Uh, he's really good at what he does. The paintings are magical. So how was it that Abraham Bradius, this great critic, this great expert, was fooled by this crude forgery that wouldn't fool you or me? And, and the simple answer is, in that line he wrote for Burlington magazine, when I saw the painting, I had difficulty controlling my emotion. By exploiting Abraham Bradius's wishful thinking, by painting the picture that he knew Abraham Bradius wanted to see, the forger managed to bypass Bradius's expertise. It didn't matter how much he knew about the technical details of painting, he wanted to be fooled. And in fact, his expertise in this particular case only made things worse. Actually gave him new reasons to believe in a painting that he should never have believed in. Uh, you or I would never have fallen for this, but Abraham Bradius, the expert, did. Now, why am I telling you a story about art forgery? Why am I beginning the first chapter of my book, which is supposed to be a book about numbers, right, that has no numbers in it, that is purely about about painting and about deception. It's because our emotional reactions come first. If we've learned anything from the last few years, the Brexit referendum, the election of Donald Trump, we've learned that we believe what we believe because of who we are and how we feel, our emotional reactions and our preconceptions. So there's no point in me writing a book that will tell you how to solve technical problems in statistics if it don't also give you the emotional tools to get past your wishful thinking and see the world clearly. I think the one thing that we've all learned over the last few years is that what we believe is overwhelmingly determined by what we want to believe. And we're all influenced by our, by our friends, by our cultural identity, by our political preconceptions. And so, of course, our emotions matter. So the very first question I would ask in answer to, to Sarah um, is, how is this statistical claim making me feel? Is it making me feel angry or defensive or vindicated? Is it, am I, can I, do I see this as, as a, some ammunition for some argument that I want to make? Because if that's how you're feeling, you're probably not thinking clearly. Now, of course, we should be influenced by our emotions. Our emotions are important, we're social beings. It's fine to have preconceptions. It's fine to pay attention to what our friends think, but we have to be aware of that. So I, I'm advocating statistical mindfulness. I realize I now sound like Yoda with a calculator. Statistical mindfulness. Notice how the claim makes you feel. And if you're, uh, if you're, if you are, are aware of your emotions, if you're aware of that emotional reaction, you take a few seconds to observe it, maybe let it subside, I think you're going to think more clearly about how to then go about evaluating the claim and whether you should be sharing it or not. Um, second question I would ask, so Sarah's question, what are the best questions to ask when we see a number in the news? So the second question to ask is, what does the number actually mean? Uh, um, by which I mean something quite specific, like what is actually being counted? So, uh, for example, we, we see these, these daily coronavirus cases reported every day um, in the UK. Um, to understand that, um, you know, th this, these are uh, official cases, they're being processed, the tests are being done, um, the tests may be being processed with a delay of several days, um, the, you might have a test gathered before the weekend and the, the test is then being, the test result is published after the weekend. That sort of, just, just straightforward knowledge about what this number represents versus, for example, the Office for National Statistics infection survey, um, which is, this is not an official case count. This is an attempt to randomly sample the population and to estimate how many people out there have infections. It's a different 
methodology, I would say probably a better methodology for estimating how, uh, how much the virus is out there, but just to know what's being measured, what it means. Uh, I, during the financial crisis, uh, I, got, I saw so many claims that mixed up the deficit and the debt. And you'd argue, people would argue about whether the claim was true, whether the number was right. And I said, well, you, you don't actually even understand what it is that you're talking about. Or um, uh, a, another example that's in the book, um, a, a, an article in The Guardian that talked about suicide and self-harm. And actually suicide is very different from self-harm. And the definition that was being used for self-harm was, was actually ambiguous. The, the, the article didn't discuss what was meant by self-harm and then I had to go and talk to the researchers. And the researchers in the end said, well, actually we don't know what's meant by self-harm either. It's self-harm as, as defined by the, the people who responded to our survey. So it's whatever they think. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but just understanding uh, what the definition is, what's being measured, what's being described. Before, before you get into the maths, before you get into evaluating the number, that's really important. And the third question that I would ask, very simple question is, um, how does this fit into the, the bigger context? So for example, if you, if you see that there have been 6,000 daily cases uh, of coronavirus, to ask questions like, well, um, how does that compare to a week ago? Uh, is there a rolling average? How does that compare to other countries? What about France? What about Spain? How does it compare to six months ago? Can we make the comparison with six months ago? Are there, are there reasons to believe that the comparison uh, doesn't work? Now, of course, you know, as an individual, some of this stuff is a lot of hard work. You don't want to have to go through all this work every time you see a number. But you should certainly see some evidence that somebody else is doing that work for you. So if you're reading a social media post, listening to the radio, watching the TV, reading a newspaper article, if you're hearing that sort of explanation, that sort of context, like what was done, what was measured, is the number going up or going down, what is it per person or per million people, if you're seeing that, I would be reassured that you're hearing from someone who's trying to help you understand the world. And if you're not getting that context, you're, you're hearing from someone who's trying to get you excited or riled up or is trying to win your vote uh, or defend themselves against a political attack. And that's not the same thing and it's not helpful. Right, another question. Thanks Sarah for that question. Um, Dave Bradshaw, well, this leads into the previous question. Dave Bradshaw, asks, how much of a worry is it when, uh, and he puts this in, square, uh, in scare quotes, how much of a worry is it when leading epidemiologists put out misleading information about the infection fatality rate of the virus uh, and never bother to admit the mistake? Um, he links to a particular video, um, but I'm not so interested in the particular video because there's lots of this about. Um, there are, if we focus on the virus for a moment, there are a lot of people around, some of whom are eminently qualified and some of whom are not, they're amateurs or they're politicians, but a lot of people about who uh, have become very concerned with winning an argument, with making a particular case for a particular view of the world. And whenever I see that, I, I start to worry um, because it it becomes harder to really evaluate what's going on. It becomes harder to see clearly. Uh, it becomes very tempting to score cheap points. It becomes very tempting to play for people's emotions. And as we, we already saw with my answer to Sarah, you know, getting people emotional does not help clear thinking. Um, and you start getting tempted to cherry pick data, to strip things of context and to be unfair. Um, so some of, the, some of this sort of debating, this point scoring, is done by experts with some expertise, but it still makes me uncomfortable. And some of it is just complete nonsense. So uh, for example, uh, on the side of people who, who say we need, need to be very, very worried indeed about, um, about the virus, I see lots of stuff about uh, long COVID. In other words, uh, people who have uh, lasting and maybe serious symptoms who nevertheless didn't die. Um, but very little about how common this is. Um, and we need better data, of course, but if you're just 
tweeting examples of, look, there's this person and this person suffered you know, this long-running debilitating disease, we haven't really learned anything because millions of people have had the virus, tens of thousands of people have died of the virus. The fact that you can give me out a single example of someone who's suffering long-term health effects, it doesn't help me understand. Now, I, I want to understand long COVID, I want to know how prevalent it is. I think it could be a very serious problem and it's certainly something we should investigate. But I want to explore that with the mindset of someone who's seeking after truth rather than someone who's trying to make a particular point. And you see on the other side of the debate, the, the lockdown uh, skeptics, I think they often call themselves. Uh, again, and they're very loud. Uh, and we've skipped from one point to another, like, well, the infection fatality rate might be super low because maybe everyone's kind of already had it, or we're just on the brink of herd immunity, or uh, died with COVID versus died of COVID. Uh, and now all this nonsense about uh, false positives. Um, and in each case, yeah, there, there's somewhere under th those arguments, there's a really important point to make. False positives are a thing. Uh, asymptomatic undetected cases are a thing. Um, herd immunity might be more prevalent than we think. But when it's used, again, to make a particular argument, uh, we're, we're getting stupider, we're not getting smarter. So uh, it disturbs me when I see anybody arguing for a particular case rather than just trying to explore the truth. And you can see it's not hard to see what's, you know, who's, who's doing what uh, on, on this sort of thing. Um, a question from Sally Stevens. So Sally Stevens says, uh, should it be mandatory for MPs to have some statistics training? Um, probably not because, uh, you know, in the end it's a democracy and we voters uh, need to take responsibility for who we elect, right? But uh, I think it would certainly be helpful for MPs to have some statistics training. And there are two separate points. Uh, one is that we just need a more diverse group of MPs. And by diversity, I refer to all kinds of things, um, you know, the, the things that you, you're probably thinking of. So um, MPs from different ethnic backgrounds, MPs from different classes, different parts of the country, different educational backgrounds, uh, men and women, uh, different um, uh, sexual orientation, uh, MPs with disabilities. We need all of that. We also need uh, MPs with different educational backgrounds. So there's a lot of lawyers in Parliament and quite a lot of people who studied history and classics and even a few who studied PPE like me. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But it would be good also to see MPs with mathematical training, statistical backgrounds, chemistry, physics, biology, medicine. We need all of these things. So the, the world is a complicated place. The decisions that MPs have to make on our behalf, they're complex. And you're only going to get the best decision making when you have that real mix of different expertise in the room. So there's that. Second point to make is the research done by um, Phil Tetlock, Barbara Mellers and Don Moore became famous uh, as the super forecasting research. Um, there's a great book called Super Forecasting by, by Tetlock um, and uh, Dan Gardner is his co-author. Uh, one of the things that they find is that even quite brief statistical training, like an hour of statistical training, really helps um, forecasters to make better predictions about the world, more robust predictions and really understand what's going on. So there probably is a, a case for some statistical training. Um, I don't think it's that hard. I, I mean, another thing we could do is maybe we could just, uh, everyone could mail a copy of how to make the world add up to their local MP. Um, it's a great idea, now you suggest it. but. This stuff doesn't always require a PhD in statistics or advanced mathematics. A lot of it is basic critical thinking skills, plus the motivation to understand what's happening rather than try to win an argument. And of course, MPs are highly motivated to try to win arguments, which is a problem and uh, not a problem I can entirely blame them for. That's just the way things are. Right, oh, a uh, question from uh, Will Moy, who runs Full Fact. Uh, what stat do you wish you knew and why? She will, I don't know if Will is aware of this, but he's in the book uh, quoted as saying that we know more about golf than we do about victims of serious crimes such as uh, rape 
and uh, sexual assault and um, uh, assault and murder. Um, why do we know more about golf than we know about the victims of these crimes? Um, because the, uh, the survey that measures physical activity, sporting activity, is much bigger than the crime survey. So it's higher resolution, it enables you to make statements uh, about local areas, it enables you to make statements about rare activities. Um, now this isn't because some civil servant or some politician at some stage said, you know what, um, we've got the statistics budget and we really think sports are more important than crime. It's just because the, the uh, Victims of Crime survey has been running for a long time at a particular size. And then when the London Olympics came along, there's this big push for sporting participation, a big budget to, to encourage sporting participation and therefore a big survey of sporting participation. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but just goes to show that we, sometimes we make these arguments, we, we collect these statistics almost by accident. We're not very um, considered about what we measure and what we don't. And I should shout out for um, Anna Powell Smith's blog, Missing Numbers, I think it's missingnumbers.org, but you can find it, um, which basically just tries to track um, things that maybe the government should be measuring and, and isn't, and in particular, things the government used to measure and then stopped measuring, and, and often uh, didn't even notify anybody that they stopped measuring it, the data series just disappeared. The power not to collect numbers is, is very important. Uh, all that said, okay, so to answer Will's question, what stat do you wish you knew and why? Um, well, when I was finishing off the book in, in late April, the answer was very clear. It was the infection fatality rate. I wanted to know the infection fatality rate of coronavirus because it was still, I think, highly uncertain and hugely consequential. Um, and people were emailing me and saying, you said in your latest column that the infection fatality rate might be 1%, but it's clearly, um, uh, you know, one in 2,000. Uh, I mean, it, if it's one in 2,000, uh, everybody in the UK had coronavirus twice in March, April and May. Uh, there's no way to make the deaths come out any other way. Um, so it's clearly not one in 2000. So that, that was the number I really wanted. Um, I think we've done a lot of work figuring out what it is. I think we now know um, it was about 1% and it has been coming down. It's been coming down because um, older people who are much more vulnerable and people who are vulnerable for other reasons are doing a better job of uh, hiding from the virus and we're doing a better job of shielding them from the virus and also because treatment is uh, is getting better uh, possibly also because we're doing a better job of shielding people from uh, from high exposure to the virus so these various things are helping to bring the infection fatality rate down from one percent to half a percent which is obviously important um, still a really nasty virus um, and incredibly dangerous for for people over the age of, of 70. Um, so, um, you know, that's the number I, I, that's what I would have said when I was writing the book, if you'd asked me. What number now? So there's a lot in the book about uh, algorithms. There's a long chapter on algorithms. And one of the things I really wish we knew more about was the effectiveness of algorithms that our politicians are often deploying to make decisions about us. Uh, so we have algorithms that are deci deciding uh, who gets bail and who doesn't get bail. So we saw this summer algorithms that are replacing A-level and GCSE exams. Uh, and I think the algo shambles of the summer really indicated part of the problem, that somebody had managed to persuade politicians that uh, this very painful decision they'd made to, which was to cancel everyone's exams, um, didn't have to be painful at all because there was the, going to be this magic algorithm that would just give everyone the right grade. Which, when you think about it, it's clearly impossible. How could an algorithm give you the right grade for an exam that you haven't sat and you're not going to sit? It is impossible. Um, and I think if uh, politicians had recognised that back in March, they could very quickly have said, OK, what are we going to do about the fact that there is no way to give people their grades fairly. Um, 
What are we going to do to survive a world where we don't have that information anymore? Could we postpone the exams? Could we start expanding um, uh, higher education? What do we do? But instead, people just thought, well, the algorithm will be fine. Um, so I want politicians to have a, a better sense of what these algorithms can and can't do. But that then leads into this missing statistic that is so often missing uh, that Will Moy asks about, which is very often we don't have any proof of effectiveness of an algorithm. We don't see algorithms evaluated, uh, with, for example, with a rigorous randomized trial, which you would often want to do. If you've got a medical decision-making algorithm or a, a policing algorithm to compare uh, what the algorithm is doing versus what human judgment is doing and to say, yeah, the algorithm is or is not making the decision more quickly, more accurately, etc. So you made these grand claims for these algorithms that are commercially secret, that can't be evaluated by independent experts. We want to see what's going on inside the algorithm. We want independent scrutiny and as much as anything else, we want proof that it actually works. Now, we don't take vaccines or drugs without proof that they work. Why on earth should we let an algorithm make decisions without proof that it works? I'm looking at my clock. I've talked for too long. I've talked for far too long. I'm going to shut up now. Um, thank you for everyone who, uh, to everyone who sent in questions on Twitter. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. Uh, there are loads of good ones. The book answers some of them. Uh, you can always drop me an email if there are others that you want answered and I will do my best. Um, thank you so much to the uh, Oxford's uh, Maths Department, the uh, Mathematical Institute, for inviting me to speak. Thanks again to Blackwell's Books uh, for supporting How to Make the World Add Up. And final wor word to, to all of you, be curious about the world. Try to think clearly. Try to ask uh, the questions that you, that you want answered whenever you see one of these statistics. Um, don't use statistics as weapons. Don't stand for other people using them as weapons. Use them instead as a kind of telescope to see the world more clearly. You can do it. I believe in you. I think we can all do it. And uh, we're going to make it easier for each other uh, if we all band together on this point. So thanks very much.